Good evening, unit holders of Maple Tree North Asia Commercial Trust, MNACT. Thank you for joining us tonight. This uh, dialogue session, which we call now virtual information session uh, between CRS and MNACT CEO, Ms. Uh, Cindy Chow. We are organizing this so that you can make an informed decision on issues that may still be lingering in your minds. On 31st December, 2021, the representative, respective uh, managers of Maple Tree Commercial Trust, MCT and MNACT jointly announced the proposed merger of MCT and MNACT to create a flagship commercial REIT in Asia which now will be named Maple Tree Pan Asia Commercial Trust or MPACT. The merger shall be effected through the acquisition of MCT by MCT of all the issued and outstanding units of MNACT by way of a trust scheme of arrangement. On 21st of March, 2022, Maple Commercial uh, MCT revised its bid for Maple Tree North Asia Commercial Trust MC, MNACT to include a cash only option for MNACT unit holders. The value of the scheme consideration remains unchanged at $1.1949 which is equivalent to the net asset value per MNACT unit for all three options. The merged entity will have 18 assets across Hong Kong, SAR, China, Japan, and South Korea, and Singapore. The portfolio is balanced across sub-asset classes with 21% business parks 35% office and 44% retail. Based on market price, most MA City unit holders would likely take up option three, in my view, which allows them to realize the NAV 1.1949 in full cash. If the resolutions are approved, MA City will become a sub trust of MCT, which will then be renamed. Maple Tree Pan Asia Commercial Trust for Impact. So tonight we have invited the senior management of MNACT to join us at this dialogue session. Ms. Cindy Chow, Chief Executive Officer, will kick off the session with CEO as CEO of MNACT, and she will share some updates and information on this proposed merger. Then we will address your questions as well later after our Q&A. So please submit your questions now via the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar or during the webinar. Okay, I will now invite Ms. Cindy Chow to take us through with a short presentation over to you. Cindy, good evening. Thank you for coming. We would like to hear you. Good evening, good evening, and welcome to this dialogue session. So we'd like to hear from you before we ask you the questions we have in mind. Could you do the presentation, please? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerald. Good evening to everyone, and thank you for joining the virtual dialogue session this evening. As you are aware, the managers of Maple Tree Commercial Trust, or MCT, and Maple Tree North Asia Commercial Trust, or MNET, have proposed the merger of the two REITs. And we believe that the merger will be transformative and upon completion will create a flagship commercial REIT that provides stability and scale across key gateway markets of Asia. The merged entity combines the best qualities of both REITs, particularly the strength of MCT and the growth potential of MNET. The key rationale and benefits of the merger are that the merge entity would create a proxy to key gateway markets of Asia, 
Uh, it would also be anchored by high quality and diversified portfolio. The merged entity would also leapfrog to one of the 10 largest REITs in Asia. It would be well-placed to pursue growth opportunities through a ready platform, and it would offer attractive financial benefits to both unit holders of MCT and MNET. And of course, there would be continued strong support from the sponsor. As a quick overview, the merged entity will have assets under management of about 17.1 billion Sing dollars, with net letable area of 11 million square feet, a high overall portfolio occupancy of 97.2%, healthy weighted average lease expiry or whale across all leases of 2.5 years, and aggregate leverage ratio of 38.8%. Moving on to the transaction overview. Now the merger is to be effected through the acquisition of MCT of all MNET units by way of a trust scheme of merger. In consideration of the transfer of the MNET units, the price or the scheme consideration is at $1.1949 per MNET unit. Now this is in line with the latest net asset value per unit of MNET and implies a one-time PNEF or price to NAV for MCT. The MNET unit holders are offered three scheme consideration options. Firstly, the script only consideration, where unit holders will receive 100% consideration in units based on 0.5963 new MCT units for every one MNET unit. Secondly, the cash and script consideration comprising 84% of consideration in units based on 0 0.5009 new MCT units for every one MNET unit and a 16% cash component, which is at 19.12 cents in cash per MNET unit. Thirdly, the cash only consideration, which means all cash comprising 100% uh, cash based on $1.1949 per MNET unit. And in order to fund the increase in cash requirement under the cash only option, the MCT manager will undertake a pro rata non-renounceable preferential offering. Now Maple Tree Investments, which is the sponsor for both MCT and MNET, has elected to receive the script only consideration. Do note that for MNET unit holders who do not make any election or fail to make a valid election, the default option will be the cash only consideration. We would also like to highlight that MNET unit holders will be able to continue to receive the permitted distributions up to the day immediately before the effective date of the scheme. The merged entity will be renamed Maple Tree Pan Asia Commercial Trust or MPACT with a broadened investment mandate to invest in income producing real estate used primarily for office and or retail purposes and with an expanded geographical scope to key gateway markets of Asia. The sponsor Maple Tree Group continues to demonstrate strong conviction and support for the merger and its confidence in the long-term value and articulated strategy of the merged entity. Now, the sponsor has undertaken to subscribe for the maximum preferential offering units of up to $2.2 billion, demonstrating its full backing of the preferential offering by MCT to fund the increase in cash requirement of the cash-only option. So there will be no incremental debt financing and no increase in the maximum number of MCT units to be issued. The sponsor's undertaking to receive 100% script-only consideration remains unchanged, and the sponsor has also agreed to a voluntary six-month lockup of its unit holding in the merged entity. The sponsor continues to support MCT manager's agreement to waive its acquisition fee entitlement for this merger, and the sponsor supports the adoption of the REIT management fee, which is packed to distributable income and BPU growth, that will promote closer alignment of interest with unit holders. So this is a fee structure that MNET is currently uh, adopting.
so you can see from this chart that the merge entity uh, will continue to leverage on the domain expertise and track record of the sponsor, which has an established global presence in 13 markets and over 66 billion Sing dollars in terms of AUM. Now I have highlighted the rationale and key benefits of the merger at the start of the presentation. So I will elaborate on each of these in the following sections. The merge entity will comprise of 18 assets across five key gateway markets of Asia with a total AUM of 17.1 billion. Singapore will contribute 52% of the AUM, followed by Hong Kong at 26%, China 11%, and combining Japan and Korea at 12%. The merger will combine the regional and local operational capabilities of MNET and MCT respectively with domain expertise to enhance further growth. Now, MCT has been successful as the leading SREACH with the best-in-class assets in Singapore while Mnet has been successful in seeking new acquisitions beyond our IPO geographical markets of Greater China and expanding into Japan and South Korea. With both REIT's network and strong local expertise, proven track record of investment and asset management, and also the ability to capitalize on the sponsor's strength and network to further strengthen and deepen our regional footprint, the merge entity will be a ready launch pad for Asian expansion and also enabling the merge entity to establish footholds in multiple markets swiftly. The merger will also provide Mnet unit holders access to a stable and best-in-class portfolio in Singapore, where a number of the assets are located along the Greater Southern Waterfront Precinct, poised for urban transformation that will create a new major gateway for urban living, working and entertainment. Um, there is deep liquidity that we've seen in Asia, which would provide growth opportunities. Um, as we can see in 2021 alone, there was a total transaction volume of USD $106 billion. And the merge entity will be able to tap into some of the largest and most established real estate markets in Asia. Now, the merge entity will be able to benefit from the long-term rise of Asia by capitalizing on the resilient growth of key markets. So while the impact of COVID-19 continues to be felt globally, the economies of the key gateway Asian markets saw a rebound in the gross domestic product in 2021 as restrictions were eased gradually. So briefly across the five markets, uh, in Singapore, which is one of the world's key trade logistics and financial hubs. Retail sales are expected to gradually return to pre-COVID levels. And we can see that uh, recently we have been seeing a slew of uh, easing in terms of the uh, distancing measures. Um, and then market dynamics continue to be conducive to the recovery and demand for good quality, decentralized offices and business park spaces. Now, moving on to Hong Kong, in terms of the retail market, uh, we do expect that uh, retail market and consumer sentiments will continue to improve and gather pace, especially uh, when cross-border travel uh, reopens. Um, and in terms of the office spaces, we do expect leasing demand to improve and rentals, particularly in the Kowloon East area, to remain stable. Now, moving on to China, which is the world's second largest economy and also the only major economy to post positive GDP growth in 2020. The Great A office market in uh, the Lufthansa area, which is um, the location where our property gateway plaza is located. Now, this location is expected to recover by early 2023, supported by steady demand from key business sectors. And moving on to Shanghai, where our business park, Sandhill Plaza, is located. Um, and that is in the location of Zhangjiang Science City. Now, this is an innovation hub in the Pudong area in Shanghai. And we expect to be able to continue to ride on the growing IT and biomedical sectors growth. Uh, and demand is expected to continue to outstrip supply. 
in this location and therefore to continue to drive its rental growth. Now to Japan. Japan is the world's third largest economy supported by strong core industries. Uh, we have seen resilient demand uh, in our Japan properties and this resilience is expected uh, to continue for offices in decentralized and suburban areas given the relatively lower uh, cost um, option that can be offered in these locations compared to the city center and also uh, there's very low new supply expected in these areas. Now finally to Korea, uh, South Korea, uh, the Gangnam Business District where our property the Pinnacle Gangnam is located now, this location continues to see very low um, vacancy levels. Uh, we see continued strong demand, uh, especially from the IT sector and the pharmaceutical sector. And we expect that the office sector would continue to uh, outperform given the strong demand and no new supply expected in this location. Now, the merge entity will have a diversified mix of assets across geographies which reduces the single asset concentration and strengthens the portfolio resilience, both in terms of the AUM as well as the net property income contributions. And post-merger, the top 10 tenants will contribute 23% of the merged entity's gross rental income. Now, this is a healthy reduction in terms of income concentration compared to MCT and MNET uh, individually before the merger. The merge entity will continue to maintain a high overall portfolio occupancy level of 97.2% and also a well-staggered and healthy weighted average lease expiry of 2.5 years. The merger is expected to create one of the top 10 largest suites in Asia with a market capitalization of about 10.5 billion Sing dollars. This is a significant increase compared to MCT and MNET's market cap of about 6.6 .6 billion and 3.9 billion respectively uh, as at the last trading date, which was before the announcement of the proposed merger. Now, the increased scale of the combined portfolio with one of the broadest Asian mandates will boost its appeal and relevance amongst the global investor community. Now, the merge entity will have a free float size equivalent to or greater than MCT's current free float size, uh, which is valued at 4.5 billion Sing dollars as at the last trading date, again, before the announcement of the proposed merger. And this is expected to remain as one of the top five largest assets in terms of free float size. The merge entity is also expected to continue to be a constituent in key representative indices including the FTSE IPRA NAWIT Developed Index, the MSCI Singapore Index, and the Straits Times Index. There would also be enhanced financial flexibility to pursue more growth opportunities by the merged entity with an expected aggregate leverage ratio of 38.8% as at 31st of March, 2022 on a pro forma basis. And with a larger debt funding capability of about 3.9 billion Sing dollars. This will allow the merged entity to act more swiftly to capture investment opportunities and greater flexibility to pursue larger acquisitions and undertake capital recycling initiatives, strengthening its overall ability to compete for inorganic growth opportunities. Now, the merged entity is also expected to have a large um, development headroom of $1.7 billion Sing dollars which allows it to undertake more asset enhancement initiatives and develop initi initiatives to boost organic growth for unit holders. Now on the financial returns for MNET unit holders, the proposed merger offers attractive financial returns to our unit holders. The scheme consideration is at $1.1949 per MNET unit and this is equivalent to the NAV per unit of MNET as at the joint announcement date. It is an, at an attractive premium of 7.6% to 17.3% over MNET's trading prices during varying trading periods, whether it's a five trading day VBOP, three month or up to a 12 month VBOP, as you can see from the chart. 
And for this chart, it shows that the skin consideration is at an attractive premium of 8.49 to 17.65 Singapore cents over MNET's trading prices at the varying trading periods. The skin consideration of $1.1949 translates into a one-year total return of 32.2% to MNET unit holders. And this outperforms the market benchmarks comprising Singapore and Hong Kong market indices and bonds. Now, how was the skin consideration determined? Um, the skin consideration was uh, extensively considered and negotiated between the two rate managers. Uh, and of course, we took into account uh, various factors, including the short-term and medium-term uh, uncertainty of the portfolio, but uh, bearing in mind the long-term benefits that the merger uh, would provide to our unit holders. Uh, we have looked at um, extensively uh, across the two REITs, the relative trading prices, uh, the MPI yields, the distribution yields, um, president as we merger transactions, um, of course, valuations of uh, both sets of portfolios, um, as well as the pro forma financial effects um, of the merger. So all these were very extensively thought through and the scheme consideration was eventually arrived at um, based on all these factors, as well as um, two key considerations, one being the gross exchange ratio and two, the PNF or price to NAV. Now, starting with this slide, you can see that the scheme consideration was determined based on a premium to the historical exchange ratios over a three-year period, which takes into account the pre-COVID-19 uh, years, as well as the pre-Hong Kong social incident periods. So based on the scheme consideration of $1.1949 per MNET unit and the scheme issue price of $2.0039 per MCT unit, this implies a gross exchange ratio of 0 0.5963 times. And at 0 0.5963 times, this is a premium of between 8.9% and 23.7% to historical exchange ratios over a three-year period. Now, moving on to the price to net asset value, the PNF, which is implied uh, by the scheme consideration. Uh, this is above MNET's historical average PNF, which were between 0 0.8 and 0 0.89 times over the past three years. And if you look at the chart at the bottom, this is also above the mean and median PNF of comparable peers. For, for example, in the case of S REITs with greater China focus, the mean and median PNF is about 0 0.8 times. For the Hong Kong REITs, that's about close to 0.5 times. And for the Japan REITs, that's about close to 0.9 times. So post-merger, um, the merge entity would be managed by the MCT manager. And the MCT manager will adopt a tailored 4R asset and capital management strategy to drive growth. So Singapore will remain a core market to provide underlying portfolio stability. Hong Kong, uh, the manager would focus on stabilizing and improving festival work before considering further expansion. China, the focus would be to maintain high occupancy and to seek opportunistic acquisitions in office and business park assets. South Korea, which is a favorable market to be in, um, it would be primed for further targeted expansion by the manager. And finally, Japan, uh, the manager would continue to maintain its performance and capitalize on opportunities for any strategic divestment in future. So essentially, uh, the aim is to continue to drive NPI and DPU growth and also to unlock value through selective strategic divestments at opportune time and to focus on the creative acquisitions of office and office-like business park assets in key gateway cities. So both MCT and MNET have demonstrated firm and long-standing commitment to sustainability and have been proactive in making positive impact 
to our stakeholders and the environment while delivering long-term value. So moving forward, the merged entity will continue to incorporate wider ESG issues into policies and business strategies and increase our engagement with key stakeholders in this respect, develop roadmap to meet more stringent green building certifications, continue to participate in RESB and to align to the TCFD or Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures in providing a robust global benchmark for sustainability performance. Now, moving on to the approvals that are required from unit holders. So the EGM and the trust scheme meeting for MNET is scheduled on 23rd of May. So there will be two resolutions, one each at the EGM and at the trust scheme meeting. Now, the first resolution is at the EGM, which is uh, for unit holders to approve the proposed amendments to MNET's trust deed to introduce provisions to facilitate the implementation of a trust scheme of arrangement. The second resolution is to be tabled to the unit holders in, during the trust scheme meeting, and that is for unit holders to approve the merger of MNET and MCT. Now, MCT will also be holding uh, the EGM on the same day, um, and there are four resolutions. Um, so the first resolution is for unit holders, for MCT unit holders to approve the merger between MCT and MNET. The second resolution is for MCT unit holders to approve the allotment and issuance of units of MCT to MNET unit holders as part of the consideration of the merger. Um, the third resolution is a proposed whitewash resolution in relation to the concept party proof of MCT. And the fourth, is the proposed amendments to the MCT trust deed to adopt the management fee uh, structure. Um, so I'd just like to highlight that uh, resolutions one, two, and three are interconditional on the part of MCT um, uh, uh, approvals. And resolution four is not a condition for the merger to proceed. So whether or not um, the uh, fee structure would be amended uh, to be aligned with MNET's current fee structure, uh, that will be subject to a vote by the MCT unit holders, but that will not uh, be, that would not affect uh, whether or not the merger will, will be approved by the MCT unit holders. Um, in terms of the recommendations of our MNET directors, um, the independent directors, as well as the recommendation from the independent financial advisor, um, I'll start with the recommendation for the resolution one that will be tabled during the EGM. Uh, that, re that resolution is on the trusted amendment um, and our MNET directors have um, recommended that uh, the amendment would be beneficial to and would be in the interest of MNET unit holders. And therefore, they do recommend that MNET unit holders vote in favour of the trustee amendment resolution. Now, for the second resolution that will be tabled to MNET unit holders during the trust scheme meeting, um, the opinion, based on the opinion of the Independent Financial Advisor or the IFA, uh, which uh, had considered, uh, they had considered carefully the information um, available to them, and they are of the opinion that the financial terms of the trust scheme are fair and reasonable. And accordingly, they advise the MNET independent directors to recommend that MNET unit holders vote in favour of the trust scheme resolution. So accordingly, our MNET independent directors, having considered carefully the terms of the trust scheme, the advice given by the MNET Independent Financial Advisor, and also taking, taking into account the various factors set out in the IFA, IFA letter, including uh, the MNET 805 Auditor's Opinion, recommends that the MNET unit holders vote in favour of the trust scheme resolution. Now, in terms of timeline, The, we would like to remind unit holders that the last date and time for lodgement of the proxy forms 
which is for ED holders to vote uh, for the resolutions uh, one and two that I've mentioned earlier on. Now, the last date and time for lodgement of these pro proxy forms would be by Friday, 20th of May. Uh, the MNET EGM and Trusky meeting will be held on the 23rd of May. And should MNET unit holders and MCT unit holders approve the merger, uh, we expect that the effective date of the trust scheme uh, would take place sometime in early August. And for the payment of the scheme consideration to be sometime in mid-August, and the date of delisting of MNET to be also sometime in mid-August. Now, please do note that the timeline for these events post the EGM date of 23rd of May uh, would be subject to uh, changes. So please do look out for our announcements or future SGXNet announcement for the exact dates of these events. Now, finally, um, there would be some uh, questions from our unit holders regarding odd lots trading arrangement. So MCT or M sorry, MNET unit holders may receive odd lots of new MCT units as part of the consideration of uh, the MNET units. So uh, for us, the MNET manager, we will facilitate the trading of the odd lots so that for unit holders who wish to round up or down their holdings to the nearest 100 MCT units can do so. So do bear in mind that the odd lot trading is for a period of one month, commencing from the date of allotment and issuance of the consideration units. So this one month period is called the applicable period. So each MNET unit holder can buy up to 99 MCT units and can also sell up to 99 MCT units per day. We've got three brokerage firms to facilitate odd lot trading, uh, DBS, Vickers, OCBC Securities and Philips Securities. And there will be no brokerage fees charged for the odd lots trading during this applicable period. Thank you, so that ends my presentation. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, so from your presentation, it, the conclusion is that this merger allows the new entity to become, or to leap, leapfrog, to become one of the largest in Asia, in terms of one of the largest 10 REITs in Asia, right? And uh, you say that uh, there will be attractive financial returns for MNACT unit holders. So the objective is to grow the DPE value. And you have also said, in terms of support, that the IFAs have recommended uh, to unit holders to vote in favor of this, so has the IDs. Cindy, um, your unit holders were hugely supportive in the past two years when MNACT diversified to Japan and South Korea after the challenges in Hong Kong. Uh, one of the first justifications is that, that the merger provides MNACT immediate access to stable and majority best-in-class assets in Singapore. But some shareholders, some unit or MNA cities unit holders have raised this concern. They say they can just take out their smartphones and buy MCT units right now from the open market. And MNA city can therefore, thereby save all the professional fees incurred for this merger. Is that a fair? Fair statement. Well, you know, we, we did consider very carefully the rationale and the terms of the proposed merger. Um, and we do believe that the proposed merger is beneficial uh, to our unit holders uh, from strategic, uh, financial, and also operational perspectives. Now, I, I think there definitely are numerous benefits that can be achieved through the merger as opposed to having MNET and MCT operating on a standalone basis. Uh, as I've mentioned during the presentation, we believe that the transformative uh, merger will create a flagship commercial REIT that contributes uh, to um, better benefits for unit holders because we are basically combining the best of both REITs, uh, the strength and stability of MCT and the growth potential of MNET uh, as one. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at uh, how it will also allow the MNET unit holders 
to expand into a very strong, stable portfolio of Singapore assets. Um, and, so, and also riding on to um, the transformation of the greater Southern, water, Southern Waterfront uh, that we have been reading uh, lately of. Um, we do believe that, you know, that actually gives uh, much more stability and resilience in terms of portfolio uh, for our unit holders. Now, operationally, uh, we also see that there will be synergies that can be realized through uh, the implementation of best practices across this enlarged platform, uh, integration and cross-pollination of the MCT and MNET teams uh, basically across the key functions and geographies. And also uh, with, you know, tenants across uh, all the diverse markets, it will also give uh, our tenants the uh, ability to choose locations when they think of expansion, when they think of relocation, when they think of setting up uh, new uh, operations in some of these Asian markets that, you know, we can work with them right, to uh, offer all these choice locations within our portfolio in the diverse markets uh, to the tenants. Um, and then financially, we think that, you know, it's definitely uh, better uh, for the two REITs than them operating uh, separately as one. Um, as you can see uh, in the earlier presentation, the merged entity will have more diversified um, geographical markets uh, also more diversified uh, tendencies. So effectively, we are reducing single asset concentration, reducing uh, tenants' uh, income contribution concentration. Um, and that is actually going to uh, provide uh, more stab stability and also resilience to the portfolio. Yes. Um, also for impact, they will also have access to a much higher debt funding capability. Uh, I talked about, you know, as much as a 3.9 billion debt headroom that will allow the merchant entity to be able to make acquisitions, you know, as and when the opportunity arise very swiftly and also to undertake, you know, asset enhancement works or even some parts of development works to uh, continue to grow the GPU for uh, the unit holders. So that would be for the new entity. Yes. Those who wish to stay and not cash out. Yes. Yes. I mean, we so, definitely believe that, you know, the two is better than, you know, each of us sure. uh, operating separately. Yes. yes. So long-term view holders would consider that. But can you confirm that the cash only option would be in default should MNA City unit holders do not vote? Ah. So as you can see uh, from this slide, um, yeah. So if uh, unit holders uh, do not elect or they fail to make a valid election, then the default option would be the cash only option. Mm. But in order to be able to receive um, any of these options, then obviously the unit holders will have to vote. So you yeah. need to vote uh, essentially for the merger to happen before any of these elections uh, can materialize. Mm. Okay, so if size is the matter, is everything, are we going to see a maple tree REIT that combines the commercial, industrial, and logistics assets in the future? Well, we are unable to comment on right. the future plans of our other REITs. Right. Um, but uh, we do note that in recent times, um, our sister read had commented that um, they have no plans to merge. Uh, so um, I think um, uh, we will leave it as that for now. Okay. Just for information, I mean, for unit holders who opt for option one, script only, or option two, cash and script, they will receive some impact, impact units in exchange for their MNACT units, right? Yes. Right. So post-merger, MPEC will be focusing on the 4R asset and capital management strategy, which you are blind. Uh, the 4R stands for recharge, refocus, reconstitute, and resilience. In your slide, South Korea, Singapore, and select cities in China have been identified as the growth markets. And the question is, the merge entity will have a 2% exposure to South Korea. So naturally the unit holders want to know 
uh, from you more about the South Korean market, how attractive or how, you know, um, favorable is that market? Is South Korea just Seoul? Um, well, uh, technically, uh, yes. So in terms of the office market, uh, it is uh, basically focused or concentrated in Seoul. Now, uh, from a macro perspective, South Korea is the 10th largest global economy and also the fourth largest in Asia by GDP. Um, and we have seen that the economy had remained relatively resilient and also contracted to a much lesser extent compared to other countries. Uh, in fact, it was the first major Asian uh, market to raise the interest rates uh, since, the, uh, since the pandemic began. So uh, this is actually an indication of its market recovery. Um, and we have also seen how it has recovered from uh, this uh, pandemic-induced drop in terms of uh, GDP to uh, having a 4% increase year-on-year year, uh, in 2021. So back to the office market. Uh, so yes, it is focused mainly on um, Seoul uh, in terms of all the um, uh, bars and activities. Um, and for the Seoul office market, essentially what we are seeing are really favorable market dynamics. Um, firstly, there is um, low new supply. Uh, they're expected to come on stream. Uh, in fact, I think over the next five years. And then secondly, uh, we have seen very strong demand particularly coming from the uh, technology sector, the IT sector, uh, the pharmaceutical sector. So across the key uh, office submarkets in Seoul, we have seen a decline in vacancy rates and uh, definitely uh, improvement in terms of rental growth. So in the case of our property, the Pinnacle Gangnam, which is located in, of course, the Gangnam Business District, um, it is in a very good position to continue to benefit uh, from this strong leasing demand and also the high uh, growth sectors that are you know, ever looking for space, uh, whether to start their operations or to expand their operations. Um, and also the other uh, uh, um, advan advantage that we see in the Korean market is that there is always an inbuilt rental escalation within the lease term itself. So over the course of a three-year lease term, uh, or you know, uh, if it's a longer lease term, there will always be a per annum uh, rental escalation embedded. So the organic growth uh, would also be uh, there. Mm. Um, I think with uh, essentially the uh, rapid growth in terms of online businesses, um, and then also all these uh, high-tech companies coming with strong financial backings, uh, we do expect that they will continue to be uh, important players in taking up uh, the office spaces. Um, and I, I believe that uh, for the um, MCT manager who will be leading the merged entity, uh, they will continue to identify and pursue acquisitions of uh, targeted uh, good quality office assets in this market. Um, you also have China offices, business parks, have also been identified as a growth area. Uh, so is Japan, uh, you know, question is, is Japan also an attractive market for impact? Or is a read more a seller in Japan, firstly? And then in China, you have the zero COVID policy, which might impact the REITs plans. Can you elaborate more on the Japan Japanese and Chinese expansion plans? Is a REIT focusing on tier one cities only? Hmm. Uh, maybe I'll start with Japan. Japan. So Japan has um, obviously an attractive real estate uh, market. Um, there is a very favorable spread between the asset yields and the cost of funds. So the average yield spread is attractive. Uh, we have seen a huge number of transactions that have taken place in the real estate sector uh, over the past two years in Japan. So for Mnet, uh, we have also taken the opportunity to expand in Japan through acquisitions in 2018, uh, 2020, and also in 2021. And now we have a portfolio of nine assets. Um, the Japan properties uh, that we have are mainly the decentralized offices. That means they're located in outside of the key city area. Uh, some are in the fringe of the city. 
Um, and we actually do see that they have been uh, very stable, uh, particularly over the last two years, uh, and have maintained high occupancy. Um, in terms of rental performance, uh, we do expect that these locations where our, our properties are would continue to remain resilient, uh, given that particularly in times like these, office occupiers will be looking at uh, seeking lower rental options, uh, which are uh, predominantly in the decentralized or city fringe areas. Um, and therefore, you know, we, we do think that we should be able to uh, capture more of such demand. And especially for those occupiers who are looking at, you know, business continuity planning, and therefore they need to set up offices uh, at the satellite uh, areas. So I, I think the Japan properties um, would continue to be very stable um, and resilient and provide this stable income stream. Uh, to MNET unit holders and of course uh, in future to the merge entity. Um, but when we look at post-merger, uh, we also have seen from an earlier uh, chart that I've shown, uh, the contribution from the Japan properties will be actually fairly small in terms of the overall merge <coughs> entities portfolio. Um, and as you can recall, uh, I have been uh, talking about Japan being a very stable portfolio, uh, very stable market, uh, very resilient. So, of course, you know, from MNET's perspective, that has been very um, important uh, uh, in balancing, you know, with the uh, uh, somewhat more volatile uh, conditions that we have seen in the greater China markets. Mm -hmm. Now, over to the merge entity, uh, where, as we mentioned earlier on, uh, about 50% of contribution will come from the core stable Singapore market. So, they already have a huge stable portfolio there. Um, so I believe that um, the uh, MCT manager will, uh, of course, uh, continue to uh, maintain the operational performance of the Japan properties. After all, you know, Japan assets, they do provide lower cost of funding and they do act as a good hedge against uh, volatility. Uh, but at the same time, I'm sure, you know, they will uh, also reconst uh, reconstitute uh, the, the portfolio upon a successful merger and uh, probably uh, make some selective uh, decision, uh, divestment decisions at a later point in time. Uh, so anyway, that I would leave it to the uh, new manager to probably uh, give more details in the future. Okay, now for unit holders who are considering staying on as Im impact uh, unit holders, they would, they would want to know from you if the worst is over for festival walk, you know, because the festival work is the largest asset, the REIT's largest asset, and is valued at Hong Kong dollars, 25.57 billion, uh, as at 31st March, 2022, 54% of the REIT's total portfolio. So, um, so they want to know, is the, worst, is the worst over for festival work, or is the rebound in sight? Can mm -hmm. you briefly answer that? Sure. Um... For Festival Walk, in fact, um, I think we started on a positive note with the relaxation of social distancing measures, yes. um, also rising vaccination rate in Hong Kong. Uh, back in um, the last financial year, uh, we're talking about you know, April 2021 all the way to, uh, of course, uh, end of uh, 2021. Um, and we have also actually seen uh, improved retail sentiments uh, within 2021 because of, you know, the uh, uh, better market conditions. Mm. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at our latest results announcement, um, I would say that um, for the first nine months of our financial year, uh, we saw a negative rental reversion uh, of about 30%. And, but uh, in the last quarter of the financial year, we saw a narrowing narrowing of the rental negative rental reversion to about 18%. So there has been a, some improvement. And I think that's, um, uh, it's really because of, you know, the better market sentiments that we have seen uh, towards the uh, last uh, two quarters of 2021. Um, and over the uh, financial year um, of uh, April 21 to March 22, in terms of our tenant sales and shopper traffic, they have also increased year on year. 
um, sales improved by about uh, more than 8%. Uh, tra shoppers traffic improved by more than 11%. Um, and, you know, I think definitely the uh, low infection cases and of course the government support, right? They were uh, giving out these, yes. uh, e these consumption vouchers to the residents. So that really stimulate, you know, uh, spending and of course uh, stimulate consumer sentiments. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, we did see that the fifth wave uh, came along in January this year. Um, and that affected, of course, uh, the retail sales. I think overall retail market uh, sales dropped for the first time in Jan, February this year. Uh, but having said that, I think, you know, there have been some good news in recent times. Uh, so we have seen infection cases coming down very much. Uh, the authorities have also started to relax the measures, in fact, accelerated some of these relaxation. Um, dining bans during dinner time has been lifted. So now you can dine in in restaurants up to 10 p.m. instead of you know, up to 6 p.m. Um, and then, of course, the government has also further uh, gave out uh, some of these uh, consumption vouchers. Um, we have seen traffic improved at the mall. Um, so I think uh, with all these support measures coming from the authorities, uh, the stabilizing of the COVID situation in Hong Kong, um, we, we, we do stay cautiously optimistic that yes, but things should improve. The world experts, including our Prime Minister, has recently said we should you know, expect recession in two years, within two years. And this is going to be a global situation. How does that impact on your, on your own uh, you know, predictions? Mm. Um, well, I think, you know, we, we have been through um, hard times uh, yes. over the last two years. And in fact, pre-COVID, if you recall, uh, also um, the uh, social incidents that we've experienced uh, in Hong Kong by the mall as well. Um, I think we have also over the course of the last two or three years, um, a pivot towards, you know, certain traits that we feel would be more resilient throughout uh, cycles and throughout you know, different periods of um, the market. Uh, and, and we found particularly that, you know, in terms of trades, uh, the f and trades, um, yeah. the lifestyle trades, and the uh, services trades, you know, these are really just uh, fundamental to mm -hmm. any consumer. Uh, we believe that, you know, these are really a uh, staple in terms of, you know, what uh, consumers would require, you know, be it, you know, in, a, in good times or in, uh, you know, lesser than good times. Yes. And, and a market like Hong Kong, where, you know, we, we do appreciate that, you know, most of the um, households uh, in terms of, you know, where they stay, the uh, households, the, the house uh, or apartment sizes are relatively small as well. We know that it's, you know, it's a very densely populated city. Um, you know, surely they need to have these, you know, social gathering uh, venues and, you know, malls whereby they can, uh, you know, still continue to, you know, buy things that they want, experiential uh, shopping, uh, you know, um, also assessing to some of these uh, lifestyle services. So I believe that, you know, uh, some of these uh, changes some of these uh, pivoting to, you know, post-COVID times uh, should continue to put Festival War in good stead going Thank forward. Thank you. Here's a question from a unit holder who is with us tonight. As the date of completion, as of the date of completion, MNACT's delisting is expected to be end August 2022. And considering that this date will be just one month, shy of MNACT's first half FI 2022-23 DPU distribution, will management consider final distribution of the 2022-23 pro rata earnings up to the date of delisting of MNA City shares, expected to be worth up to five months of MNA City's earnings in 2022-23. This is also in consideration that MCT had earlier stripped out the MNA City's earnings stroke DPU distributions to de derive the net acquisition price of $1.1949. Could you shortly and very briefly answer this question? Well, the short answer is yes. There will yes. be a clean-up distribution. 
Yes. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, that will be up to the, the day before the effective date of the scheme. Yes. So Good. please be assured that there will be uh, uh, that distribution uh, yes. before, before the effective date of the scheme. Okay, that's good news. Next question from the unit holder. Will the current directors and management team for MNA City still be in the combined entity? Because I do, not, I do know what are the MCT team's capabilities in terms of managing overseas assets. Can you answer the question? Is it something that you can or cannot? Uh, well, as we have announced uh, yeah. to uh, everyone, um, the new uh, entity or the merge entity would be managed by the MCT manager. So in terms of the board constitution, uh, that will be uh, determined by the uh, MCT board and MCT manager. Okay. The next question from another unit holder, the amount of new space for shops could quadruple uh, from just over a million square feet this year to about 4 million square feet in 2023, according to Savills. Kindly comment the likely impact of new supplies in Hong Kong in 23 to 24 on the festive walk property, thanks. Yes, um, I, I believe there are some uh, new developments coming up uh, over the course of the next few years, um, but uh, technically they are not exactly uh, very close to where Festival Walk is located. Now, Festival Walk enjoys the benefit of having two train lines that goes directly you know, underneath the property. Um, and in fact, uh, we do see that we serve very well. Uh, particularly our catchment area within the Kowloon Tong uh, vicinity. Um, and recently, again, another piece of good news, um, there is a new connection um, to directly to uh, the Hong Kong Island from Kowloon. So right now we have this Israel line that passes through uh, Festival Walk, which is at the Kowloon Tong station. And this line stops at uh, Kowloon itself at the Hong Ham station. But just, uh, I think last week, it was announced that um, the link from Hong Ham to the Hong Kong Island side uh, is ready and uh, going to be operational. So, you know, that will facilitate even better for uh, residents who are staying in the Hong Kong Island side to even travel to the Kowloon side and particularly, you know, to malls in the Kowloon side like Festival Walk, uh, saving them, you know, that uh, commuting uh, time and distance. Uh, I think that will actually augur well for Festival Walk. Okay. So I, I think at the end of the day, it also depends on the kind of offerings the mall has uh, to the community. Uh, and I think what we have done over the uh, past few years and also moving forward, we should be able to capture um, the, the crowd uh, better uh, with our transformation into uh, post-COVID uh, trades. Okay, next question. What is the NAV per share after merger impact and prospective dividend payment per share post merger fund? Can you answer this for the next three years? It will be not within your capacity to do that now. Well, um, I, I, I'm afraid I'm, a, I'm not able yes. to give um, yes. that uh, forward looking yes. forecast. Forward looking statement. You're not yeah. Yes. May I know what is the estimated DPU payable for the period 1st April 2022 to the completion date of this merger? Has that been calculated? Uh, so again, you know, I'm not able to offer the specifics uh, of the distributions, uh, but certainly there would be that distribution all the way up to the day before the effective date of the trust. Based on the previous basis, fundamentals, you know, the measure, if you want to measure it, uh, what was the basis prior to that and what it's going to be for the remaining period? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Jarrett. The, the you yardstick that? you're going to use for the DPU based on the previous yardstick or is going to be a new one? Are you referring to the distribution, the under, distribution. MNET bef yes. under MNET before yes. the merger happens? Right. Correct. Uh, well, you know, it will be based on MNET's performance uh, yes. for, for the few months before the uh, effect, effective date of the trust scheme. Okay. Mm. Next question. How will the operating expense, interest expense, and income of MCT and MNACT be affected by the proposed merger in view of the assets are mostly geographically separated? 
China, Japan, Korea? <laughs> well, you know, um, you, you could imagine uh, that it's basically combining, well, you know, what we have been doing for MNET and what uh, MCT uh, has been uh, operating at. Um, I think in terms of uh, um, interest cost uh, impact, well, as you can see for MNET, we have been exercising very prudent capital management in terms of, you know, hedging our interest costs uh, to, to mitigate any um, uh, increase in uh, the rise of interest costs. Uh, we have also been hedging uh, our currencies uh, in order to uh, mitigate uh, some of these volatilities, right, in the uh, currency, in the forex exposure. Um, and uh, in fact, as of end March 2022, if you look at our interest cost hedging, we have hedged, I think, more than 70%, I think almost 78% uh, for uh, our uh, interest uh, as of end March 2022. Uh, even for our distribution for um, first half of FY2223, I think we are hedged up to more than 70%. Um, so as you can see, you know, it will be a progressive um, hedging strategy that um, the manager would adopt. Uh, and we do think that, you know, given our track record uh, of uh, making sure that uh, appropriate exposures to all these volatilities are uh, hedged, uh, that would continue to be the case, even under the new merged entity. Well, there is an appreciative uh, unit holder. Thanks to you for the informative sharing. You have shared the potential upside to be expected from the merger. Can you please discuss some downside risks involved? Example, tightening of financial conditions, inflation, geographical tensions, can you? Well, in fact, I think um, certainly with all these uh, risks in mind, diversification is key, uh, which is what, you know, the proposed merger, uh, mm. a, a transformative merger would bring to the table to both sets of unit holders. So as you can see, you know, you're diversified across five key uh, Asian markets. Um, you know, each comes with it. Uh, 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 diversification in terms of you know risk exposure, in terms of um, uh, you know interest cost exposure, or even in terms of you know forex exposure. So take yeah. for example, um, as of end March, uh, twenty twenty two, um, if you look at MNET's uh, financial results, you'll find that you know while we saw the weakening of the Japanese yen and Korean won against the Sing dollar, but we also at the same time saw a strengthening of the Hong Kong dollar and renminbi against the Sing dollar. So, you know, there, has, there is this, you know, consistent, consistent uh, balancing, right, of some of these uh, risks in terms of, like, you know, cost, for instance. Um, and then I talked about, you know, in Japan, you have a low cost of funding. That's a good hedge against um, you know, the volatility that we have seen in the market. And so that will contribute, you know, for purpose of the merge entity uh, in terms of balancing some of the, uh, volatilities in say you know the other markets so i think the key is really diversification and i think uh, it is no better time than now to really look at a more diversified um, uh, platform uh, that can be even stronger uh, mm. to withstand all these uh, you know volatilities uh, that we see good now you may not be exact, but here is a question. Peking and Shanghai lately sees a spike in COVID-19 cases due to their zero infection strategy. How much will this affect the DPU and share prices of the new impact entity? Um, great impact, medium impacts, you know, you know not so bad, in, you know, I mean, basically in terms of impacting, yeah. Uh, well, yes, we, we have seen um, some of these uh, tighter measures being taken uh, by the Chinese authorities, uh, both in Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, now, our properties in Beijing and Shanghai are offices. Um, uh, to date, uh, as we have also uh, mentioned in our latest results announcement, um, we have not seen uh, uh, any significant impact on our properties. Um, we only have very 
uh, little retail amenities within these office properties. So, you know, we think that for the uh, retail tenants, uh, like the F&Bs, the supporting amenities, they might be a bit more affected because, you know, people might not be coming to the office to work. But otherwise, uh, from the office standpoint, uh, I think um, the tenants are basically managing. In fact, in Beijing, um, we still have tenant staff operating in the offices. There is no mandatory lockdown as yet. Of course, uh, tenants uh, or you know residents are mostly encouraged to work from home where possible. Uh, so the the I think the the situation is still evolving, uh, but I do believe also that in the case of China, as we have seen all this while, uh, they do have various levers that they will exercise to mitigate any of these um, uh, impact on the businesses. So we have seen, you know, even at the start of the year, uh, before, you know, the recent um, uh, uh, COVID situation in Beijing and Shanghai, we have already seen them uh, cutting their reserve requirement ratios, uh, as well as uh, interest rates, and uh, not just for um, you know, residential mortgages, but also to the businesses, you know, to support uh, the local economy. Uh, recently, they have also been fairly targeted uh, looking at reducing tax and fee cuts uh, to support the SMEs. And uh, just, I think today or yesterday, the uh, authorities again came in to, to try to support uh, businesses, uh, encouraging all the um, government agencies and state-owned enterprises to uh, keep employment stable in order to you know, keep uh, the local economy uh, stable. So I think, uh, Really, there, there would be uh, measures that the authorities will continue to uh, put into uh, the, the economy to uh, make sure that things are still stable and uh, will still uh, run, run along smoothly. Well, okay, and you must be tired. Now, this is the last question. Uh, this regarding Gateway Plaza, Cindy, uh, which has been deteriorating according to this unit holder. Uh, in terms of occup occupancy, it has been deteriorating and rental revision. And with China growth slowing, uh, you know, with COVID impact in various cities, is it reasonable to expect it will continue to worsen? Any plan to sell this property? Well, for Gateway Plaza, um, we have mentioned uh, in uh, our results, uh, announcements, briefings, that uh, really it was uh, a case of, of course, new supply that come on stream, particularly in the uh, central business district locations. Uh, so that had given, uh, of course, some pressure uh, to gateway, uh, especially in terms of occupancy, in terms of uh, rental. Um, but having said that, I would say that you can see our occupancy level has remained high. Uh, we are still uh, at about 95%. Uh, considerably high in the current market uh, in Beijing. Uh, and also uh, in terms of uh, retention rate of our tenants, it's still considerably strong. Now, the negative reversion comes about uh, because of, as I mentioned, the uh, higher supply that has come on stream. And also, of course, unfortunately, uh, the market has been hit right by the two years of COVID situation. So a lot of um, plans by uh, companies, whether to you know, expand or set up new offices were also held back. Now, having said that, um, we think that uh, basically uh, before, of course, um, the uh, latest development uh, of the COVID situation in Beijing, we actually have seen uh, some increase in terms of demand by offices looking for spaces, particularly in our location. We have also seen expansion requirement within our own tenants in the building. So I think that um, going forward, we are actually, um, again, uh, cautiously optimistic that the negative reversion itself uh, would likely bottom out. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, as what the uh, industry players are projecting, the market will probably recover by 2023. So, Gateway Plaza is not that bad after all. Well, you know, considering that, you know, we are still very well occupied, yeah. uh, we have seen actually uh, some slight improvement 
uh, in terms of you know our ability to negotiate for better rents. Um, I, I do believe that you know the the property uh, should be able to uh, maintain uh, its performance uh, in terms of occupancy level and uh, probably look forward to better uh, reversion rates going forward. Thank you. Again, just on the uh, e, uh, uh, EGM, can uh, unit holders submit their proxy forms via email? Is there live voting at the EGM? And, um, yeah. Yes. Go Sorry. ahead. Yeah, and I mean, these two questions before I ask you to round up, yeah. Okay, uh, so yes, uh, you can submit your proxy form via email. Um, and so uh, the votes will be through either uh, email or by post. Um, there won't be any live voting uh, during the EGM. All right, so concluding remarks for one minute. Well, I think um, Uniholders, uh, if you look at the chart that is shown on the screen, um, this is uh, definitely uh, something which uh, we would like to reiterate once more to all of our unit holders, that the merger is a transformative merger that combines the strength of MCT and the growth potential of Mnet. So very importantly, I'd like to run through once again the key rationale and the key benefits. Uh, it will create a proxy to key gateway markets of uh, Asia. Uh, it would be anchored by high quality and diversified portfolio across five different markets in Asia. Uh, it would leapfrog to one of the top 10 largest REITs in Asia. It's definitely well-placed to pursue growth opportunities through a ready platform. Yes, carry on. Uh, and it will um, uh, offer very uh, attractive financial uh, benefits to both the MCT and MNET unit holders. Uh, and of course, uh, we would see the platform uh, unlock even uh, more uh, higher potential in terms of you know, its future growth, uh, given its uh, much higher debt funding capability. Uh, and last but not least, we will continue to have a strong uh, support from the sponsor. So uh, as with the recommendation by the MNET independent directors, uh, as well as the recommendation from our independent financial advisor, uh, we would encourage all our Mnet unit holders uh, to vote uh, for the merger. For the merger, good. So, uh, unit holders, you've asked very good questions tonight, and uh, you've got very thorough answers from Cindy. Th thank you very much for being so informative and giving elaborate answers. But if you have any more questions, you can still write to. Cindy Chow's office, uh, CEO's office, and definitely, um, you know, you will answer the questions before the EGM, if there are any more. So thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you, Cindy, for taking your time to be with us. Good night and all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerald. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.